Great, we're live, Tim. So um, we are literally, um, we've just hit the button of go live, so we probably haven't got any of you with us right now, so that's fine. So um, we are literally... Got a bit of reverb there, so... Okay, great. Um, so we'll just give a little bit of a brief introduction, I guess, before we start. So. Um, for those of you that are joining us, if anyone wants to um, ask questions and things as we go along, absolutely uh, feel free to just type them in the comments box and they'll come up. Um, and if we see them and they're relevant, we'll try and answer them as we go along. Um, and if not, we will get to them um, after the presentation. All right. So welcome to those of you who've joined us tonight. Tim and I are going to be talking about the cycling foot. So I'm obviously Tim, just uh, just there. Um, if you don't know anything about us, um, well, basically, um, we've got a bit of experience in terms of being physios, bike fitters. Tim's a university lecturer, so a ton of years, really experience combined. And we've worked with quite a multitude of people you know from beginners right the way through to some pro athletes and pro teams so really the whole point of this webinar is to just give you guys a little bit more of an understanding about the foot and how it might really vary um, in cycling versus running for example so learning objectives today we're just going to talk a little bit about relevant foot anatomy we also want to just mention some of the common related disorders that you might get on the bike but not only the ones that you might get on the bike some of the ones that might pre-exist as well, because they will affect how the foot engages with the pedal. Um, and also just be aware of some of the options that are presenting to you in terms of resolving foot issues on the bike, because um, despite how running might present itself with a varied evidence base on, you know, shoe choices and orthotic choices, actually with cycling, um, there can be quite a contrast. So, you know, really, we would make a statement that the foot really is the gateway to any good bike fit. Essentially, it's what connects you to the pedal. And it's the only really true fixed point on the bike. Um, we don't really know the true incidence of foot related disorders on the bike as well. And just like with the saddle, a lot of cyclists believe that, you know, numbness, etc. and foot problems are something to be expected. And OK, if you do long distance cycling, you know, you might be. Uh, something that you are prone to but generally for the, the usual cyclist this is something that can be resolved and, and the foot's really important not only for comfort but for power production as well so over to Tim to talk about anatomy thanks Bianca yeah so as you just touched on there what we know about the foot in cycling is actually very very little and we don't really have much data from the, the research world to back up what's happening regarding any kind of injuries or pathology. So if you guys are, are listening in tonight and your your physios or your bike fitters or your coaches and working with athletes, we haven't actually got a lot of hard data to, to back up what's going on. There are some researchers out there who are doing some research at the moment and they are starting to to build our, our knowledge on that but it is it's only slowly starting to come so going through the anatomy side of things just to kick us off i'm not doing an anatomy lecture don't worry but the the message i want to get across to you is we've got a lot of knowledge when it comes to the foot mechanics and the kinetics of how it all works which are coming from walking and we're even struggling to transfer, uh, to translate that into what happens in the foot in running. And it is, again, it's very, very different to what then happens in cycling. In that, in a cycling shoe, it's very much of a fixed lever. But we need to make sure that we're still supporting the foot and accommodating its natural shape and, and positions uh, through the maybe insoles or through the, the type of footwear that we're using. So this is what we're maybe going to explore a little bit further down the line. So when it comes to the, the foot itself and the shape of the foot, we've got obviously 26 bones. There's a lot of bones in that foot. And that then creates different shapes within the foot. We've got along the inside edge of the foot, we've got what's known as the medial column. And then on the outside edge of the foot, we've got the lateral column. So this 
comes into what we're thinking about regarding how the foot is then putting pressure down through the, the, the shoe and then through the pedal. Are they loading down through the lateral column of the foot or are they loading maybe down through the medial column or is it nice and balanced? We can then break the foot up into the forefoot, so that's the front of the foot, the midfoot, and then the rear foot where the heel bone is. Supporting all of that, we've got a lot of ligaments and connective tissue. The so one that most people are aware of, things like the plantar fascia, which then blends into the Achilles tendon. So the calf muscle is obviously doing a lot of work pulling through that Achilles tendon, which blends through to the plantar fascia. And that's then giving you a lot of support through the bottom of that foot. We've then also got a lot of ligaments running transversely through the foot to support the transverse arch and to stabilize all the metatarsals and the, the rest of the foot through here. So again, it's thinking about the shape of that foot and what the uh, passive structures are doing to stabilize it. As well as all those passive structures, the bones and the ligaments, we've also then got a lot of small muscles, the intrinsic muscles of the foot, which are also working very hard to stabilize and support that foot but in a slightly different way as to what we would normally see in walking or then even running. So what we might see in our off the bike assessment is when we're looking at somebody just standing is, well, what's the shape of that foot? Have they got a very flat foot or have they got a bit of an arch through there? And can they change that? So can they do this, what's called a short foot exercise? So can they use those small intrinsic muscles to actually contract and shorten that foot? Or have they not got that control and therefore maybe they need a bit more passive support in order to stabilize that? So this gives you a bit of a, an x-ray example of variations of normal. So you've got somebody who has got quite a flat foot on that right hand side of your screen. And then you've got somebody who's got naturally a uh, larger arch, a higher arch in their foot. And both of these are normal. However, if you think about a standard cycling shoe that might have just a very, very flat footbed, that might work very well for the person on the right hand side. But the person on the left hand side may well need something a little bit more structured. And then we can also think about whether they've got a, a almost like a lower forefoot position or a higher forefoot position. And that can then influence even sort of pedaling styles and the type of shoe with maybe a bit more of a heel kick um, or less of a heel kick. So these all starts to feed into what's the right type of shoe for the type of anatomy the person's got in front of you. So bringing that all together, what we've got to stabilize this, and this is coming from um, the foot core uh, paper. There's a link to this and a reference to this at the end of our presentation. But this idea is thinking that we're linking both the nervous system working to control the foot. We've got all those passive structures that are mentioned, so the shape of the bones and the ligaments, but also the active systems, the way those muscles are working. But as I said at the very beginning, bear in mind what's happening is different in cycling than compared to walking or running. So we're still trying to work out how the, maybe that active system uh, contributes to that foot stability in cycling versus, as I say, walking or running. On top of all that, we've also got the vascular supply and the neural supply to the foot. And this starts to come into play with maybe some of the other pathologies we're going to touch on, such as some of the, the numbness, uh, pins and needles that people can get, or um, there's the, the problem known as hot foot in cycling, where you get that burning pain in the ball of the foot, which we'll come on to in a little bit. But just thinking about how this anatomy is all working together and the, how that foot needs to then stabilize in order to maintain good neural supply and good vascular supply to that foot. Another core concept that we talk about is think about that subtalar neutral, or are they in slight varus or slight valgus? And this will then influence maybe the shape of the foot, whether we need any sort of shape of the footbed and the shape of the shoe last in order to stabilize and be able to put good power transfer down through that pedal without too much movement then taking place. So we'll explore that a little bit more with our assessment. 
Um, and it's all very well and good taking into account a lot of this anatomy, but there really is no absolute sort of zero or absolute reference guide because when it comes to the foot and how the foot engages with the pedal, there are so many things that can dictate what happens. So on the screen, there's three examples here of different pedaling styles. On the left, you've got someone who generally tends to drop their heel a little bit more throughout the pedal stroke. In the middle, you've got someone who has what we might describe as a reasonably um, normal ankling process. So um, they, they tend to find there's a little bit more variation in how they point the toes, point the ankle. And on the right, we have uh, quite an extreme version of something called ankling. So essentially, this can be dictated by where the cleat is positioned, but also the type of shoe that is engaging with that foot. So if someone has a shoe that perhaps is poorly optimized, that might actually cause them to point their toes a little bit more. And whilst in itself, that might not be an issue as such, actually, when you see presentations such as extreme ankling, like on the right hand side, these might actually cause increased forefoot loading. And for that individual, they may well be contributing to certain pathologies such as the hot foot as Tim was mentioning, or certainly pain around the toes or scrunching up of the toes because you know the only way for that individual to generate power is really through the long flexors in the foot and through the calf the ankle plantar flexors whereas if you have something that's perhaps a little bit more balanced like for example on the the left hand side then you may find that actually the drive of power that they get is slightly different in addition depending on the position of your foot, you're going to apply force differently on the pedal stroke. So bike position absolutely can have some input into this, depending on whether you're in a road position or whether you're in, for example, an aero position. Um, but you know, when it comes to actually force production on the bike, instead of moving from posterior to anterior, so instead of moving from the back to the front of the foot, force generally is gonna go from lateral to medial. So a rigid foot, usually tends to be good although not always and this is where we've got to take into account some of those individual anatomical factors because we might actually find that someone's lost their transverse arch their medial arch because they've got a really stiff subtalar joint and so the only way that they can actually make contact with the shoe or with the ground because usually a lot of these things come from habits from us engaging with the ground their ground reaction forces and we then have to work out a way to resolve them on the bike when, you know, the foot really is in a fixed position. Um, when it comes to force production, as well, as I said earlier, depending on the angle of your foot, the angle of your ankle, it's going to change the point at which you apply peak force. So this might not be an issue for some of our recreational athletes, people who are cycling for enjoyment. But there does come a bit more of a serious note here when you are thinking, OK, I really need to work out how best I might get this person performing as well, how best I might get them creating power. So on the screen, we have an example here of some um, force data from some force pedals. And as you can see on the bottom, we've got the position of the crank arm. And then on the side, we've got force in newtons. So you can see the two lines. We've got a blue line and a red line. On the right pedal, which is red, we've got a lower total force production than on the left pedal. Having said that, we've actually got a reasonably even and symmetrical um, time at which that peak force is created, which is just after 90 degrees. And generally that tends to be mechanically the best place for us to apply force through the pedal. But what you do sometimes see as well is individual differences between left and right. So actually, in some cases, we might see that one foot, for example, is in a certain position and can apply greater force or force earlier on in the pedal stroke, but another foot doesn't. So this, again, takes into account the fact that, you know, there are some individual anatomical differences, but it gives us some data to say, right, look, if we're really analysing performance, where can we go? How can we try and balance this out? Because clearly this individual has the potential to do X, Y and Z, but they're not doing that. And actually, if Wendy's listening, um, Wendy Holiday and co, especially Druin, are putting out some great 
research at the moment. Um, and something else that I haven't mentioned is that when you look at force and when you look at positioning of the foot on the pedal, that's going to vary depending on the effort that that individual is really under. So a great paper here, which was open access, I believe, if you want to look and read at that, but they basically documented that when a cyclist was under greater load, there was a three to 9%, I think, increase in ankle dorsiflexion and therefore subsequent knee extension. So the foot, okay, not is not only vulnerable and open to persuasion from how it interacts with the shoe and with the pedal, but it's also open to change in its interaction depending on the level of energy or effort that that individual rider is putting in. So if you are making these observations and making some analysis, it's important to take this into account. In addition, something that's probably not well published is the fact that there do generally tend to be differences between males and females. We know this anyway, as a rule of thumb, we don't wanna go down the route saying everyone who's a male will interact with the bike in a certain way. But you do generally tend to find that females will point the toes more than male riders. So this is, again, something to come back to anatomy and think, right, what's different across, you know, the, the sort of presentation and assessment in those athletes that's causing that. So really, what is the gold standard? Well, there is no gold standard ultimately because when it comes to cycling biomechanics at the moment, although we can get an idea of what we think might be most efficient and we might have an idea of where perhaps the best place is mechanically to apply force on the pedal, we do need to make sure that we take into account individual differences, take into account as well what works for certain people for certain disciplines versus others and also just think about what's best to ensure optimum comfort as well as power. So moving on from that, we then want to think, OK, well, what's next? How do we assess that rider? There are a number of ways that we can provide assessment, but generally, um, Tim, um, the same as I, would probably start off the bike. So Tim's going to talk you through just some of the things that you want to look at. Yeah, some of the uh, key things we want to be looking at as part of our off the bike assessment is in standing get their socks off so make sure you're actually looking at this foot and seeing have they got any weird lumps or bumps what sort of shape is their foot so have a good look at it are you seeing sort of calluses anywhere blisters anywhere what's this what's the health of their their toes and their toenails even um in the, the top left picture there you're seeing i'm looking at what the the tailor position is what's the shape of his arch and then also the um, windless mechanism. So what's the flexibility through the, the plantar fascia um, and through some of the sort of flexor hallucis uh, tendons through that. Also thinking about the, um, uh, the kind of shape and alignment of the whole lower limb. So thinking about are the, the tibia and the femur aligned straight or have they got a, a bony torsion in any way? So is the, the tibia rotated? So the picture in the middle there, you can see his toes are pointing out to the side, whereas the knee is pointing forwards here. So his tibia is slightly externally rotated. And this then feeds into what we need to think about regarding cleat placement. So rather than forcing the foot to go in a certain way, we need to make sure we accommodate any potential bony morphology, uh, which might be putting the foot into a different position. Another thing might be going higher up the chain. We talked a little bit about this in our previous webinars on the pelvis, in that there may be a, a femoral torsion. So there may be some antiversion or retroversion of the hip joint. And that, again, is going to influence the alignment of how the foot then needs to interact from a heel in or heel out or toes in, toe out, depending on how you want to think about it. So that's something else that we need to explore. Another bony morphology might be, oh, no, come back a bit, Bianca. Um, Bianca's got control of the slides here. Um, <laughs> is think about maybe knee valgus or knee vera. So if there is a, a, a knee vera, so the, the knees are slightly bowed out, is the way the foot's then coming in to meet the ground, is they're going to be loading through the lateral edge of the foot more. And that's then going to force them to roll that ankle in, 
in order to meet the ground. Whereas what we might need to do is bring the ground up in order to meet the foot, because that's the angle the tibia is coming in at. Then we can actually measure that so we can get some goniometers around here. And this one here is looking at um, the alignment between the hind foot and the forefoot to again look and to see is there any forefoot varus or forefoot valgus, which then may need to be supported with any insoles or any wedges. But again, it depends on is that a, a fixed forefoot varus or forefoot varus, or is it a mobile one? So again, it's a lot of the time, um, Bianca and I will, will have somebody come to us who've had previous bike fits elsewhere. The bike fitter has, has identified maybe a forefoot varus or forefoot valgus, and they've given them shims or they've given them insoles. But actually, the, the position they were in was a mobile one. It can be changed. So sometimes it's about giving them some exercises, some mobilization work off the bike in order to regain the more sort of neutral foot alignment. But then sometimes there are cases where it is more of a fixed, and that is the bony morphology of their foot. So that's where we need to be very clear about do they really need um, any intervention putting in, or is it something that can be changed off the bike with some exercises, or do you need to refer out? Do you need to refer to a podiatrist or physiotherapist or another therapist who can help and support with the off the bike work? Some other things that um, I've come across in the past is people who are getting a lot of pinching pain, sort of front and side of the ankle, anterolateral pinching pain. So maybe they are, as um, Bianca was talking about, the different ankling, pedaling styles. Somebody that's maybe driving the heel down through that pedal stroke and they end up pinching the joint capsule. And this is quite common in people who've had previous ankle sprains, so damage to the ligaments in the joint capsule of the front side of the ankle there. So uh, ATFL, anterior, fibula, anterior talar fibula ligament. Um, so that's one test that can be used. Another one, I haven't got a picture for it there, but is pinching at the back of the ankle. So again, sometimes if you see somebody who's a very toe down rider and they're getting pain at the back of the ankle, sometimes that's actually pinching through the, the posterior capsule. Um, so again, that's another area where we want to think about maybe adjusting their pedaling style in order to offload some of the, um, the kind of morphology around the ankle there, so the joint capsule. So maybe you do want them to go a little bit more toe down in order to offload the anterolateral capsule so they're not pinching. Or it may be you need to encourage them to go more heel down to stop them pinching posterior capsule. So this slide here again is showing us the forefoot, various forefoot um, valgus. And again, this is something what you'll be looking at to think about, do we need any wedging or do we need any insole in order just to bring the ground up to meet where that foot naturally wants to sit? That moves us nicely on to something called the foot posture index. So for those of you who haven't come across this before, it forms quite a nice structured way really to look at a foot and just make some observations. It is a static measurement and it's also not a measurement that's under force. So for example, um, if we think about when we have a cyclist and they're applying force and power through the pedal and their foot deforms or their foot moves, maybe as Tim mentioned, they've got a mobile foot. We don't know that what we're looking at with the foot posture index is exactly what they are doing under load. But when you assess this, they are in a weight bearing position. So this is something that's probably pretty crucial really, because there's no point just making an observation about a foot in a relaxed and an unweight bearing position because, okay, cycling's not a fully weight bearing position and the pedal reaction forces are generally less than ground reaction forces, but, we do need to make some sort of reference to that. So we might have an idea of what direction we want to go in. And always it's about gathering your data, processing that and working out what's best for that individual. But you would never look to use orthotics and shims, etc., based on a foot posture index alone. You would want to use this in conjunction with other assessment tools. But 
the good thing about this as well is it does take into account the whole of the foot so you're not just looking at the forefoot you're looking at the forefoot the midfoot and the rear foot so you might get an idea of where on the foot you might need to be adding some support and bringing the ground up to that foot there is quite a good paper that's an open access paper actually if you check this out so it was a paper by redmond et al and they just documented some normative values for the foot posture index but as I say, the only criticism about it is that there's no real correlation between figures for this and what you might want to do on the bike. And that's fine. Again, on that one, I'll just jump in there, is yeah. there has been a lot of criticism of the foot posture index. But of course, that criticism is very much aimed towards our ability to analyse the foot and make diagnoses on this and then attribute that to maybe issues with walking or, or even running. But as I said at the very beginning here, what our foot is doing in cycling is very different to what it does in walking and running. So our knowledge base for how this applies doesn't actually exist. So this is where the research needs to take us. Absolutely. Great points, Tim. Um, and really, you know, a part of our assessment is not only looking at the anatomy, but also looking at what's their foot shape and what is the orientation really generally of their toes. So. We might have a foot that's a reasonably average size, and that's great if you buy reasonably average cycling shoes. But what happens if you have a narrow foot? So if you have a shoe that's wide or too wide, your foot's going to move around in the shoe. Now, we know based on what we've already mentioned and looked at, a rigid foot is generally a desirable trait, mostly for cycling, not always, but mostly. And so if we have a foot that's slopping around in the shoe, it's not going to be comfortable and it's also not going to be the best for performance. Conversely, if we've got a, a wide foot, the cycling world does cater better for people now who have wider than average feet. But the awareness isn't there. So Lake are a great brand. If any of you haven't heard of them for producing shoes that actually and much better from a, a, an anatomical confirmation point, really, for, for cyclists who have got shoot feet that aren't quite conventional. So have a think about that. Oh, and in addition, think, think about, about the toes. Sorry, Tim, what were you... Oh, for you, yes. No, yeah. no, I'm just saying, you know, Lake do do shoes for conventional... Uh, they do. Yes, uh, sorry. Uh, just to just clarify. <laughs> um, in addition, you want to think about the toes because... Um, the toe shape can vary quite a lot. Some people might have quite boxy toes. They might have a Morton's foot where the first toe is actually um, effectively shorter than the second toe. So the shape of the shoe at the end as well is also going to be something that you need to take into account. Does it complement that individual's foot shape? Um, and thinking about wider toe boxes, um, you've got space then as well for... Um, optimizing forefoot contact with the shoe which is exactly what cycling is we haven't really touched on midfoot um, pedaling and midfoot kind of based approaches that's probably something really for another day because that does get a bit complicated but shoes that are also moldable if someone's got a wide forefoot and a narrow rear foot shoes that are mold will mean you're going to be able to mold the rear of that shoe but still allow that rider to have volume at the front all really, really super important things to consider. And if you want to measure it, really, the better way is to either use um, like a digital caliper, but ideally you'd use something called a Brannett device. So for those of you that remember when you used to go and get your feet measured as a child for school shoes, yeah, that same device can be used now. Can be a little bit hard to take measurements on the Brannett device and extrapolate them to cycling brands. But what you'll find is when you start measuring feet, you'll realise that a lot of people have been buying shoes that are too big because they've been looking for the width. So there is a bit of a philosophy in cycling to size up shoes. And sometimes that is necessary. But when a rider sizing up three, maybe even four sizes to get a shoe that fits, you know there's really something that's not quite working for them there. So as soon as you get that Brannett device out, you'll be able to identify if they are wider than average. And Lake, again, 
not to name drop, but they do do things pretty well, have got a little wooden measuring device that actually does correlate pretty well with the size of their shoes. So there'll be no guesswork around, you know, trying to think. If you're going to measure the foot, make sure you do measure the foot in a weight bearing position, because as we mentioned earlier, although cycling, again, doesn't carry the same forces as running, your foot does respond differently when it has load through it. So if you measure for a pair of shoes in sitting, but as soon as you put force through that foot, the foot lengthens, then okay, fair enough. We need to think about whether or not we want to be creating a shorter foot with insoles, etc. But ultimately, if that foot's mobile and it wants to deform under load, it's going to elongate. And so you do need to get a pair of shoes that fit for that size. Now you can put another um, on their website. Um, you can just draw around your foot uh, in standing, as Bianca said, and then take some measurements, length and width, and then they've got a, a table which will then cross-reference as to the, the actual length and width shoe that is right for you. Um, another point there is also thinking around the, the length of the toes compared to the rest of the foot. So have they got quite short toes or have somebody got very long toes? So there may be taking a cycling shoe which fits the length of their their foot for their toes but because of the, the variance in that toe length might then influence where the cleat holes are drilled and then be able to in, your ability to actually get maybe that cleat far enough back to get underneath the maybe the third metatarsal that's what we're aiming for so it's sometimes also worth thinking about the toe length versus the rest of the foot um, as well as just the simple, pure foot length. Absolutely. Uh, the, the chat box there has been name dropping Lake a few times there, but Physique um, and other bands like sort of North Wave are also doing some quite good wide fitting shoes these days as well. So Shimano too. Exactly. We're not here to drop Lake in it. There are very We're good not options. By Lake at all. No, exactly. Um, so moving nicely on then, we've mentioned um, a little bit around assessment, but what are some of the things that you might see in feet? So as we mentioned earlier, some of these things might already be pre-existing and some of them might be symptoms that then exist or coexist as soon as that individual puts their shoe on and gets onto the bike. So over to Tim. So I think a very common condition that we'll present is hallux valgus or uh, bunions and this really is quite a common uh, pathology in the general population it's more common in females than males there's the etiology of how this develops it's not really fully understood there's lots of theories out there but there's probably lots of things which are feeding into it and there is a genetic predisposition to this as well so this from a cycling point of view you may get somebody coming into you and they're coming in for your clinic and they're leaving their socks on. They're like, oh, I've got horrible feet. Don't look at my feet. Um, take their socks off. Have a look at it. Think about the, the, the picture you're seeing there and the differences between the foot on the right and the foot on the left. And then think about the width of shoe that's going to be needed to maybe support that. And why this is going to develop, like I say, it's going to be multifactorial. We're often seeing maybe the cause of it being shoes that they're wearing off the bike, maybe the day-to-day -day shoes. In women, it's often wearing high heel shoes and put a lot of pressure down through that forefoot. As I mentioned there, there is that um, genetic predisposition with a sort of family history as well. Um, the, and then again, the sort of the flat foot, what's called pes planus as well, will also um, put more load through the, the first ray and through that big toe which can then obviously put a lot more pressure um, onto the, the big toe and the way the foot then is working in walking so a lot of this is all like I say referring to what's happening off the bike and with the walking when we're then accommodating this on the bike we need to make sure that we're finding appropriate footwear to support the shape of that foot, maybe the changing shape of that foot. Do we need to look at some form of insole that's going to be giving some support to that foot? Maybe they're going down the, the route of potentially surgery and having a bunionectomy or stabilisation surgeries through there. So again, that's something that 
you may need to uh, consider in the choice of cycling footwear. So from our point of view as bike fitters and as physios is that we've got to be looking at this, spotting it, and then potentially advising on a change in footwear, maybe some orthotic, maybe some um, insole support in order to offload any painful areas so it's not rubbing um, on the, the bony morphology through that. Incidentally so. as well, my dad is someone who has quite a severe bunion and he actually sizes up quite significantly on his shoe. Mm -hmm. So this is something to think about when it comes to shoe choice and we will mention about this later. But in addition, um, some bunions are magical. My dad's bunion can tell the weather, can tell when it's going to rain. <laughs> Instead. Yeah. Yeah. And that's it. You know, you'll often find that people will size up and maybe size up a lot to give them that width. And then, the, as Bianca's already mentioned there, they end up wearing a shoe that's actually far too big for them. And then the heel is sliding around and they're lacking that heel stability. So, yes, we need to look at wider and roomier toe boxes, but not necessarily bigger shoes in the sense of sizing up um, shoe sizes. Um, so that's the maybe the, the first one we're looking at. The next one is then looking on the, the lateral side. So are we seeing a, a tailor's bunion? So again, we're getting this sort of knobble, this lump on the, the side of the foot. And that again may be causing rubbing and irritation through the, the lateral aspect there. And again, this is where we're getting maybe increase in that pronation, that rolling of the foot in as they're, they're applying the force and, and pushing down through the pedals. So it's looking at maybe insole support in order to bring the ground up to meet the, the medial arch uh, and the, the inside edge of that foot to take the pressure off the lateral aspect. And again, make sure they've got a wide enough shoe that's not going to be rubbing on that bony morphology now. Incidentally, these can be a little bit tricky to manage because often if there is a hypermobile forefoot and you put wedges and orthotics under that, the foot's still going to want to lengthen over that. So sometimes by putting too much support in, you can actually increase the pressure elsewhere. Mm. So just something to be aware of. Yeah. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Yeah. So then we've got some other maybe lesser toe, smaller toe deformities that you may come across. Um, and these are a bit more sort of medical um, pathologies that may present in your clinic. But there's some other things that may um, show up as well, which we'll touch on in a minute. So other things you may come across, like the hammer toe deformity, where the, the toe's pulling in, and we've got a flexion deformity at the very end of that toe, the, the PIP. Um, and that then may be causing some more significant deformity at the DIP and, and the MTP joint. And what we're then going to see is that rubbing on the, the top of the, the toe. So again, it's looking at the type of insole and the type of the, the shoe, the, the forefoot area, the toe box, making sure that the material there is maybe uh, compliant enough to give that space and not rub on the top of the toe because that can actually uh, rub to the point of causing blisters and, and even pressure sores. Something that can have an impact on the next slide as well, the Morton's neuroma, because if you've got a hammer toe and your metatarsal heads have dropped, you may be putting them in a position where they are susceptible to increased pressure. Mm. So that in itself may lead to irritation of those neural structures that exist in the yep. forefoot. So then a very common problem which uh, presents in the general population as, as well as in cycling is interdigital neuromas. So swelling and thickening of the, the nerve that's running in between the long bones of the, the forefoot. This often gets called Morton's neuroma, but here's a, a, a less well-known fact. Morton himself didn't describe this one. This was a, a later attribute, attribution, yeah, whatever the word is, uh, to Morton, which was actually not correct. But anyway, we know it as Morton's neuroma. And as I said there, this is a, a disease process or an irritation of that, that nerve where it's passing underneath that transverse metatarsal ligament. And the sort of dorsiflexion forces can end up causing really quite you know, significant irritation and swelling of that nerve itself. This can happen with trauma as well. 
Um, so that's another reason for why this can develop. But essentially, it's a, a, almost like a pinched nerve, an entrapment neuropathy. And it's through that repetitive irritation of the nerve that we end up with that scarring, that swelling, and therefore that pain. So in our sort of non-cycling population, this is quite often down to wearing sort of high heels or very, very no, narrow toe boxes, which is really just squeezing that foot. It's just squashing those toes together, pinching that nerve. Um, and potentially for that reason, it is more common in our females than our males. But the main thing we want to be thinking about for our cycling population here is if they have got a Morton neuroma or they've had a history of it, is making sure they're not loading too much through the, the forefoot and pushing hard down through there. Maybe making sure that um, the, the toe box is wide enough, but maybe adding a metatarsal button, so a, a lump under the, the transverse arch of the forefoot to help spread those toes a little bit rather than everything getting squeezed and squashed together. So again, this comes back to our shoe choice and potentially looking at any kind of insole support um, or any orthotic support that may be needed to help spread those toes and create that space so they're not pinching the nerve through there. And I say the, there may be a, a, an operative treatment at the, the very end of this, but really what we're thinking about here is that non-operative management, uh, which is absolutely, is, is finding the appropriate footwear is, is the, the most important thing. Um, as I've said there, maybe using a, a metatarsal button. It may be that somebody's, um, you'd be re referring on for injections to maybe settle it down. That can work in, in some people. But again, this is maybe our more sort of physio group here that are, are listening in or the sports doc group that are listening in. But if you're getting somebody that comes in and they start describing these symptoms, then again, it's something that you may want to be referring out and saying, look, you do need to maybe go and talk to somebody about this and maybe get some treatment on it. Uh, Morton's foot. So this is, um, Bianca's already touched on this one, is where maybe that big toe is a little bit shorter than the second toe over. Um, so again, this is going to start influencing the again the shape of the, the foot and the shape of the toe box but again also where the cleat maybe needs to be placed in order to get a good balance of force across the whole of that forefoot and that interaction between the midfoot and the forefoot. So hot foot is again a very sort of common cycling condition that people will uh, complain about and this is very similar to maybe some of the sensations that people might talk about with a Morton's neuroma as well, in the is that burning pain around the sort of ball of the foot there. And again, this is down to that sort of compression of the nerves. Um, and it's often down to the foot sort of swelling in the shoe and the shoe maybe being a little bit too tight. So people often complain about this maybe on very long rides where the foot then starts to swell or very um, hot rides in the summer where again the foot starts to swell there isn't quite the space for that we start to get that squeezing that pressure on the nerve and you end up with that burning type pain there isn't actually a change in temperature in the foot it's just that pressure on that nerve causing that burning sensation what you sometimes will find though is that you have clients who ordinarily can cycle absolutely fine but they go somewhere, for example, to a warm climate and spend a long day in the saddle. And yes, absolutely. When you're in that dependent position, your foot is prone to swelling because it's working and fluid might accumulate there for whatever reason. So can your shoes basically deal with that? Do they have enough give in them to allow your foot to expand? So sometimes some people will have slightly different shoes for when they know they're going to hot weather environments. Mm. Or again, have they got the active stability in order to control that foot? Um, or again, are they fatiguing and they're losing that stability mechanism in the foot? And that again is putting um, pressure on the on the forefoot. Absolutely. The, the other driving thing, it, isn't it. Sorry, Tim. <laughs> and the other thing is the lateral foot pain. So people complaining about pain along the outside edge of the foot. So again, one of the reasons through this is maybe look at they've got a fixed morphology of the foot 
where the inside edge of the foot is maybe a little bit higher. So when they're coming down to meet the ground, the outside edge of the foot is hitting the ground first, putting all that pressure before the big toe is then even meeting the ground, as it were. Um, or is it a more mobile foot that we can then adapt and mobilize uh, in order to change that morphology? So do we need insoles to bring up the inside edge and fill in that space? Or do we need to be doing work off the bike in order to come back to a more neutral position for them? Absolutely. And sometimes shoes can make a really big difference here or wedges. So canting the shoe, um, because actually what you're trying to do is encourage better loading through that medial column. And so if there is quite a big drop when the rider goes from lateral to medial in terms of pressure application, actually you can minimise that, as Tim said, not only through insoles, but also maybe by having a shoe that's got a built-in varus, such as the specialised shoes do, or you can add that with your aftermarket shims and wedges yourself. Mm. Some people have actually brought up, Tim, um, about stress fractures and getting stress fractures from cycling which I thought was quite an interesting, um, okay. you know, I've not, not something that I've really would have thought because with, with regards to the foot, generally stress fractures are things that happen because there's um, excessive loading through a bone and the reaction forces from cycling are so much lower than running that mm. generally you would think that they wouldn't be sufficient to stimulate a stress response in a bone. Yeah, um, we're seeing find is someone who's developed a stress fracture from running so your triathletes are people who you've got to watch out for this fifth metatarsal stress fractures yeah i think if we're seeing um we're, we're going off a bit of a tangent here but if you're coming across a cyclist with a, a stress fracture in the foot we've got to be asking some very serious questions around meds so relative energy deficiency syndrome um, and getting a, a full medical workup in order to determine you know, is there something else that's going on? Because as Bianca said, the forces that are going through those bones shouldn't really be enough to exceed the tissue capacity and cause um, a fracture or stress reaction even. But if, if it is happening, then again, we've got to be exploring what's the, some of the underlying um, pathophysiology that's, that's leading to that. So um, if, you're, if you're unfamiliar with the term REDS, then definitely go and have a, a read up on that relative energy deficiency syndrome and the, the myriad of problems that can come along with that. But yeah, maybe that's a, a talk for another day. <laughs> so I'm doing this one as well. So numbness. Um, so again, another problem that people will be um, maybe coming to you with is they're complaining of numbness in their, their toes. So whether it's just one toe, some of them, or, or maybe even the entire foot. So this comes back to what I mentioned at the very beginning about the anatomy. So if they're getting numbness, it's, it's compression of often a, one of the nerves or, or maybe many of the nerves that are then supplying the foot. Um, or maybe there's compression of the blood vessels that are coming into their foot. So this, again, is where we're thinking about the posture and alignment of the foot, where their, maybe their socks are, where the, the shoe is. Is there anything there which is then putting pressure on those, those nerves or the blood vessels, whether they're passing over maybe the, the top of the foot or around the, the sides of the ankle? Or is it higher up? Or is it something that's happening maybe up around the knee, around the, the lower back, up into the spine? So is it a, a neural problem which is higher up? So we do. this is, again, where we need to be doing our thorough off-the-bike assessment to examine what's happening throughout the whole body, and that may be then influencing what's happening down at the foot there. So you may be needing to do some um, nerve um, sort of length studies, looking at um, maybe doing a sort of slump test for our, our physios here, um, looking at um, the sort of how the sciatic nerve is, is lengthening or not as the case may be and again what's happening with the, the femoral nerve and then exploring some of the um, the other nerves around there so this is again where you need to be doing a thorough assessment to see what's happening both locally at the foot but also higher up that chain however it is rare for those things which is good and usually this is not a shimano anti shimano post this is just an anti velcro straps post because shoes like this that we used to use 
actually are the ones that don't apply even pressure throughout the foot so these are the ones that can lead to quite a lot of compression as tim said over the top of the foot in addition if you if you've got shoes that are quite old and worn you get people just ratcheting them up and doing them up tighter and tighter and tighter to try and get that foot stability and actually all they're doing is compressing their vascular systems and causing numbness over time like a tourniquet essentially on their foot so boas and things like that are actually pretty good for ensuring even pressure um, just over the foot yeah i had a chap a um, few months ago who'd actually um been doing his shoes up so tight over the sort of previous months that he'd ended up causing a, a huge scarring and lump of the tibialis anterior tendon as he went through the front of the ankle because he was just cranking it in there so so tight so yeah we do see it so really we've gone through some information on anatomy etc and some biomechanics and what you're looking for but how do you put it all together and what are some of the things you might be looking for on the bike so um, when it comes to the foot on the pedal essentially there's quite a few contact points arguably there's one between the, the actual foot and the shoe so what gaps can you fill in there if necessary you've got another contact point between the shoe and the pedal so do you think that the pedal is sufficient coming back to pressure you know is the surface area big enough is the pedal big enough so sometimes shimano mountain bike pedals can be an issue here because a lot of pressure is concentrated through a small area and actually what we really want to do is try and load that medial column the first and the second toes first and second mtp regions but if we've got a small pedal, we might actually find some of that pressure's dissipated more laterally. And as a result, it's not effective. In addition as well, you've actually got the, the pedal and how it attaches to the, the bike. So it might be that, you know, when it comes to actually looking at the interaction of the foot, is there enough of a gap between the bike and the pedal? Because... There is some evidence that says maybe we don't want to just be loading the medial column. This is where it depends so much on that individual's anatomy and the width of their foot and how they want to pedal and whether or not they need clearance to kick their heels in and out as they go through the pedal stroke. Because what if there's something going on at the hip that we can't really control and we can't really resolve short of putting child children's size cranks on the bike, which creates additional issues so maybe actually you know that's also something else to think about and shimano actually do pedals where you've got another five four five mil i think it's four mil on the the width and you've also got speed play that offer different spindle lengths but there's a bit of a change here at the moment i think since they've been bought out by is it wahoo yeah um, they're making them yeah anymore so bike fit do do pedal extenders and these can be really really valuable in some cases or even just adding an extra couple of washers can be all yeah. you need yeah exactly yeah um did you see there was a um, uh, a thread recently um on one of the bike fitting forums there was a chap who was dealing with somebody who'd had a knee replacement and they had a, a wicked heel yes. kick um, and they were trying to find a way to stop the heel flicking. But, of course, the reason it was flicking was the knee replacement that this chap had had. So if you were trying to stop that that heel rotation through the pedal stroke, he, he would have the bike fitter would have ended up causing some quite significant damage to that lovely new knee that had been put in there, which both the patient and the surgeon would not have been happy about. So sometimes it's about accommodating how the body just has to move. So there was, there was an earlier question there regarding um, float and how much float should we be looking for and what type of float and should there be any float at all? Some people can get away with black cleats and no float. Some people need vast amounts of float. The answer is it depends. It depends on the person in front of you. And this is where your assessment skills need to come in to determine what type of float you need. And there's even that pedal system which has no rotational float, but they have lateral float side to side. Because again, sometimes that's what you need. So it really does depend. And I think before you even get on to the topic of shims and wedges, 
you need to have done an assessment and made sure that yes they're in the right shoe they're in you know the right position of the foot because actually do they need a wedge or do they just need that gap filling in under their arch is their foot in the right position on the pedal do they need to be wider and when you've suddenly got those things then you can start to then work out okay is this person happy subjectively are they reporting that their issues are resolved if not what else have I got left that I could try that relates back to their anatomy and what they're doing on the bike so this is where um, Tim and I both have shims because we have one leg well Tim's is a bit more extreme than mine I think but we have quite significant differences in leg length so whereas I'll sit reasonably square on the saddle because one leg's longer, I have to plant a flex through one foot um, more excessively than the other. So that does change and alter where power, where force is applied on the pedal stroke. But Tim doesn't sit so square on the saddle. So his feet are going to be in quite different positions on the bike. Um, and that the heel might kick as a result of that rather than, you know, those other options that we sort of got of trying to lock that person into the bike position. My, uh, one of my athletes has just put a comment in there, Bart. Um, hi, Bart. Um, I'll be catching up with you tomorrow, by the way. The time pedals are also another system which gives a lot of freedom of float. So, yeah. When it comes to um, cyclists, we've already touched quite heavily on insoles and orthotics. Now, the difference really between the two will be insoles are more off the shelf versions. So you can buy, you know, non prescription based insoles that will do something and mitigate and fill in some of the gap. But what you will find is that some of the available options on the market actually are nowhere near high enough on that medial arch or nowhere near high enough on that transverse arch for an individual to offer an optimum solution. So you then sort of have your semi sort of custom orthotics, if you like, such as the CDAS that can be molded to fit that individual's foot shape. And there's quite good kind of outcomes that can be had from these, but what they will do is be dependent on that individual because you're setting them up in a weight bearing position. So things like CDAS and things like the physique options, um, you know, you are going to have some limitations on that. There are some insoles out on the market called G8s, which are pretty nifty, to be fair, and they sort of fit somewhere between the two of these because although they're off the shelf, they've got a high degree of custom customization, um, and they actually come now as well so that you can adjust the, the heel wedge on them. So if you need to give someone some rear foot cant you can in isolation because rear foot cant actually if you get that in the right position then you know the rest of the foot may follow and you might just wind that foot up enough to give it some rigidity and something we've not really spoken about is you know something called subtalar neutral and the reason for that is because that comes into fold a little bit more when you are looking at prescription of insoles and orthotics um, and playing around with shims and wedges which it's quite an in-depth topic really to discuss and far beyond the capacity of this webinar tonight but something you do need to be aware of and even with subtail and neutral it has its criticisms because as we say someone have a mobile foot if you're putting someone into what we would consider anatomical neutral well actually there's some debate now about whether subtail and neutral is anatomical neutral and whether it's anatomical neutral for that individual when they have tibial torsion or femoral torsion that's presenting itself. You've got to look at the bigger picture. Yeah. I think on the insole side of things is that, you know, it might be that we're picking something just off the shelf to fill in a little bit of space in what is essentially a normal foot. But if you're seeing anything which is something outside of the, the average, outside of what you would call a normal foot, then be you know, have a network of colleagues that you can refer out to. So I have podiatrists, you know, I'm a physio, I will, I will work on the foot, I will advise on basic orthotics, I can, I can mould, I'm trained in how to make basic orthotics. However, if I come across anybody that needs something a little bit more specialised, I will refer out to one of my podiatry colleagues, because that's their speciality, that's what they do day in, day out. 
So if I'm needing uh, a cycling orthotic for somebody that's just that little bit more specialized for a medical pathology, I'm going to refer out. I'm not going to try and fix that myself. So, you know, if you're a bike fitter that's not medically trained and you're trying to make orthotics yourself, as far as I'm concerned, forget it. You should be referring out. Absolutely. And that really then brings us to like the last kind of um, custom topic to discuss in that you can get many custom shoe varieties out there that cost hundreds, if not thousands of pounds. But actually, there's a pretty nifty product on the market called the Lake uh, CX241. But they also have an MX version, so a road and a mountain bike version. And again, we're absolutely not selling Lake. But what this does is it has mesh panels on the side. So if you've got a Taylor's Bunyan or if you've got, you know, a Halux Valgus, well, this is going to accommodate those. And the actual segments mean that you can vary how tight the shoe is on the foot and accommodate a variety of pathologies. So this is your um, problem solver, if you like. So some examples. Now we'll whiz through these reasonably quickly. Um, and then we'll see if anyone's got any questions on some of the stuff we've spoken about. So here's one example of someone who had hammer toes, um, but they actually had hammer toes because it was a functional presentation. And they were actually digging in quite heavily with their long flexors to generate stability. So when we refer to instability, um, it's a bit of a loose term that we're using here. We don't mean true instability, but we mean a bit of a functional instability where the foot's not making optimal contact with the shoe. And this could be for a number of reasons, but in this case, simply, it was a case of saying the insoles just did not offer enough support for that individual's foot. So by putting something that was a bit higher through that medial arching, that gave them that proprioceptive feedback and they could relax through that foot because those insoles were taking some of that workload off for them. Something else that you might not realise, so for those of you that have seen saddle pressure mapping, here's an example of a client who presented with quite high pressure through the front of the saddle. So the image on the left you can see was their initial data capture at threshold. Now they had 1,710 millibars of pressure on the front, which is a lot. They were a front loader, so it wasn't unusual that they were putting pressure there. But simply by the addition of insoles, these were some semi-custom CDAS insoles, their pressure went down to 947 millibars. And OK, they still presented with this asymmetry, etc. But we hadn't even changed the saddle at that point. And that was what could happen and that's how much force you can mitigate just by optimising the foot. So those riders that come in and say they're moving all over the saddle, actually, it might be because they're searching for contact at the foot. And because the foot is fixed to that pedal, you know, they've got to find it in the best possible way they can. And sometimes that is by moving on that saddle. We also had another rider here. Now, he had purchased the physique shoes on the right. And you can't really grasp the context from this image, but these shoes were actually around two or three sizes too big. And he'd sized up to get the width. But actually, what we did was put him in some lakes just because they had a boxier toe area and they also had a wider forefoot area. He was also quite... A, a muscular gentleman so the amount of force that he put out through his foot was greater than the average individual so there was quite a lot of splaying and quite a lot of movement around the forefoot and obviously that could be optimized by some orthotic support but in this case he really absolutely needed a wider shoe um, and then this was quite an interesting case so you can probably see from the picture that these shoes are a little bit worn. Um, but note that the insoles are different in each of the shoes. So this lady had come in and said, right, um, I just feel like my foot is moving around more in the right shoe. So I had to put an extra insole in. So she got an insole from some trainers or some old cycling shoes, I can't remember what, and put them in. Now, if you look closely, 
this is something that found and couldn't work out why, but couldn't get the cleats lined up. And if you look at the back of the shoe, you can actually see that they're not the, si the same size shoe. So even though her feet were the same size, she'd come in and she'd bought these shoes as like seconds. They were sort of a sale and they were elastic banded together. They didn't come in a box. And the reason that she had that problem with the foot slopping around in the shoe was because actually um, one shoe was just bigger than the other. It was literally as simple as that. There was no other issue there, interestingly enough. Um, and then a lesson to be learned as well manufacturers do not drill the holes in their shoes in the same positions quality control can vary so in this case the cleats were in the same well pretty they were the same position the camera angle just doesn't probably quite show it as clearly but what you can see is that the position of the bolts on the cleat are very very different across the two so some interesting things to look at and things that you can pick up before really the rider has even got on the bike so in a conclusion there's a lot that we do tonight we didn't want to go through the um, route of teaching you how to set cleats up how to use wedges how to use insoles because that really is a topic that needs to be discussed independently um, to give it credit but there are a lot of things that you can grasp just from simply looking and talking to that rider, things that you can plan for and think, yeah, if I see that, I might want to do that. I might want to do that before you even get him on the bike. But it's really important to say, OK, what is normal? What is neutral for that person and respect that? You got anything else to add to that, Tim? No, that's it. It's just getting you thinking about. Uh, your assessment of the rider off the bike as well as then on the bike and just thinking about those individual um, idiosyncrasies of, of who that is and what that then needs to feed forward into your bike fitting decision making and maybe just raising your awareness of some other pathologies that may present in your clinic that you may or may not need to do anything about. So as our our purpose for tonight was really just to raise that conversation, get you thinking, get you exploring. So we've got some some references that you can go off and have a bit of a read of if you want to have a little bit more information. And again, we just want to start building a bit more um, educational material for those who, who want a bit more of the physio medical side of the information around bike fitting. So if you have any particular topics, any particular questions that you want Bianca and I to look into or present some some further webinars on to, to help you on that one please let us know and we can obviously put that together for you and like I say it's all about just spreading spreading a bit of knowledge and, and uh, helping you guys out absolutely and we will be uploading this webinar uh, much the same as the other webinars that we've done we have a plan for it and we're just simply putting that into action now so if you are interested in watching some of the other ones that we've done then just keep your eyes peeled on our social media channels and we'll update you when we've got that done but otherwise has anyone got any questions for us right now we're aware that there is a little bit of a delay on this as we talk versus what's going on on facebook so if we give you a few minutes just type some questions in the comments box and if anyone does have any then we will answer them. But otherwise, in terms of the next webinars, um, we will have some more scheduled. So um, there's talk that uh, Ruben is going to do one with us, Mr. Swart, maybe Wendy, if she will get involved, which will be good. Um, Katrina Rye who is a physio and a pro triathlete and no doubt some others that we have yet to be confirmed so as I say keep your eyes peeled and it doesn't look like we've got any questions so with that in mind we will look to draw to a conclusion now if anyone has got any questions that they want to ask privately or what have you, feel free to tweet or get in contact on Instagram or Facebook and we'd be happy to answer them for you. But otherwise, uh, I guess we'll be leaving you to enjoy the rest of your evening. Thanks for listening, guys.
Thanks for listening. See you.